Hello everyone and welcome to the next webinar series. This is our May webinar and we will be conducting webinars every fourth week of the month. So please stay connected for welcoming sessions, upcoming sessions. I'm Aparna Deshmukh, Technical Director with Next, and I will be your moderator for today's session. We are excited to dive into our today's webinar titled Pultruded Non-Metallic Solutions for the Built Environment, Why, What, How. For continuing education credit, attendance for the entire duration of today's live webinar will earn you a certificate of completion for one PDH. Your certificate will be available in ACI University under the Certificates tab within two days. ACI is an approved education provider for the American Institute of Architects and the International Code Council, and this webinar has been approved for one learning units. Let's get started with a short description of our today's webinar. This webinar will explore the use of non-metallic fiber reinforced polymer composites as a cost effective solutions for the built environment, offering limitless shape possibilities through the pultrusion process. By addressing limited awareness among professionals, it aims to provide participants with the necessary knowledge and tools to understand and implement non-metallic pultruded solutions. Our learning objectives for this webinar are as shown on the screen. Now let's welcome and introduce our today's speakers. We have three presenters for our today's webinar from the University of Miami. Our first presenter, Francisco Di Caso. He is a principal scientist at the Department of Civil Engineering and Architectural Engineering, University of Miami. He serves as the managing director of the Center of Integration of Composites into Infrastructure, an NSF Industry University Cooperative Research Center focus on technology transfer. Dr. Dicasso is a member of ACI committees 130, 135, 364, and 440, and also a co-chair of ASTM D3010, uh, that is Composites for Civil Structures, which is actively developing new standards. His research focuses on resilient materials, structural integrated solutions for the built environment, and the decarbonization of the concrete and cement industry towards carbon neutrality by 2050. Well, let's welcome Francisco Di Caso. Our second presenter is Asan Harati Khalilabad. He is currently a first year PhD student in the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering at the University of Miami, working under the supervision of Dr. Antonio Nani and Dr. Francisco Di Caso. He received his master's in structural engineering from Polytechnic Tehran, Iran in 2016. After graduating in 2016, he worked as an engineering supervisor in a consulting engineering company for five years. His research interests are primarily focused on composite construction materials, structural design, and sustainable infrastructure design. And our third speaker is Alvaro Ruiz Emperanza. He is a postdoctoral associate at the University of Miami. Alvaro graduated with honors with a bachelor in civil engineering from the University of Basak, country, Spain, did a master's of science at the University of Applied Science in Munster, Germany, and a PhD at University of Miami, USA. His research interests are the durability assessment of fiber reinforced polymer rebars and the structural behavior of FRP reinforced concrete elements. He is an active member of ACI committees 440 S806 and ACIF development, and an active member of ASTM D13 and D13, related to composites, material, and infrastructure. So with no further delay, I request Alvaro to start his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. So, so let's start with the, with the first part out of three, as Aparna mentioned, on why non-metallic non protruded materials are used. To put you a little bit in context, um, I'm, I'm going to present this slide, which has a summarized timeline of the development of composite materials. As you can see, there are a lot of milestones. I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but I'll explain a little bit how it 
started. They all happened in the early 900s when the first composite plastics were developed. Then in the 1930s, the FRP began to be used in, in for commercial applications. And then there was a very important milestone in the 1950s, which bring us to, to this presentation, which was the development of, um, of the protrusion process. So that was in the mid 900s when the protrusion process was developed. And that opened up um, the use of composites for a new uh, array of applications with structural um, profiles and others that we'll jump into it uh, during the presentation. But that was again in the mid 900s. And as you can see at the later part of the timeline, you can see that right now um, there are different guides and, and standards made by ASCE, the Euro code that again, we'll also jump in uh, during the conversation or during the presentation, but uh, at least you have um, a feel that right now uh, we, we already have the science guides and standards. So let's get into this um, late part of, of the timeline. So as I mentioned in the mid 900s, the protrusion was developed and it's already 50 years since the first Structural Plastic Research Council was established. So basically this is nothing new. It's been already 50 years around. Um, in the 90, uh, 979, the first uh, design manual was published by FHWA, which is again um, almost 50 years since we have the first design manual. Then other organizations, um, a lot of development happened in, in the European Union, also in North America with, as I mentioned, ASCE uh, and other organizations that started to develop uh, a lot of these guidelines to for a safe and efficient use of uh, non-metallic elements. So if we talk about applications in a context, context of, of, of the timeline of the history, the first structures were the single story cable frames for electromagnetic interference uh, structures in computer and electronic industry. And that was because one of the main properties of composite materials is that it's electromagnetically transparent. So that was a, a great, uh, this was a great application for this type of structures or this type of materials, sorry. Then one of the largest market segment, which is still the case, it's the energy. Um, it all started with the cooling tower industry that is still uh, in use. And now lately there's a lot of composite materials being used in the wind industry and others. Um, so it is still is one of the biggest uh, market segment. For construction and bridges, which is what brings us today to this presentation, I uh, just uh, mentioned that it's been since the nine, uh, 90, 1970s that um, non-metallic uh, non -metallic protruded sections are used in bridges and other construction uh, elements. So let's get a little bit into the key attributes. Why are these materials uh, used and the use it's been increased significantly lately? Here are some of the main attributes, as you can see. One of the main one is the durability. Non-metallic non materials and uh, composite materials are durable, they don't suffer corrosion, so uh, they extend the service life of structures. On those same lines uh, of durability, we see that uh, it brings low maintenance. So it's not that it also only extends the service life of the structure, but also during the use of the structure, since they are durable, you don't need that much uh, maintenance as compared to other traditional materials. Another important one is the lightweight. It's one fourth of the, of the steel. So that brings a, a lot of uh, advantages such as lower cost of transportation, uh, lighter structures, and also the installation, as you can see, it's easier because it weights less and safer. 
I mean, it's different if you are in a, in a job site and you have like big cranes because the materials are heavy, or you can um, use a, a material that it's lightweight, that it's easier to, easier to transport from one place to another so that the workers are in a safer uh, work environment. In addition, um, it has high strength. So uh, the high performance of these materials are also very advantageous for some, some of the applications that we will mention uh, afterwards. And it's, as I mentioned before, it's electrically non-conductive. Um, so this is very important for applications where there's electricity involved and you need a structure that isolates that um, electricity to have a safe environment such as the platforms for uh, for metro stations. And finally, uh, let's touch base a little bit on the low thermal conductivity. This is very important for, for buildings, for example. You, with, with this material, you avoid thermal breaches um, and it's great as, as an insulator for sandwich panels and, and some other applications. And it will bring a lot of uh, savings in energy, which nowadays it's it's a hot topic. Let's go to the next one. And on the next slides, I have about four slides where I'll be talking about some of the properties that these materials have. All, this, all the graphs look very similar. You will see that there are uh, eight different materials presented. Uh, the first two that are in purple are um, composite materials. The first one is unidirectional, made by protrusion process. The second one are mats that are um, multidirectional, not unidirectional. And then we have some uh, metallics, uh, nylon and PVC. Just to keep you uh, focused on the topic, I'll just talk about the first one, that is protrusion elements, and the third one, which is mild steel, and I will be comparing throughout the slides. So on this first one, we'll talk about the tensile strength and the junk modulus. On the left-hand side, we see the tensile strength, as I mentioned in the slide before, the tensile strength of um, protruded composites, it's three times higher than the mild steel. So we have a, a very high strength material. However, on the right side, you see the junk modulus or the stiffness. Uh, we see that the non-metallic protruding materials are about one fourth of that of steel in terms of stiffness or a junk modulus of elasticity. So that's something to consider. It's, it's a property, so it's not bad or good, but it's something to consider when we are designing. If we get a little bit more in detail on, on these properties, we see on the left-hand side, the stress-strain curve of steel materials. Um, I'm sure that all of you have seen this before. Uh, we see that it's linear elastic until the yielding point, and then we have the yielding, and then we have a plastic behavior. On the right-hand side, we compare steel with two types of composites, carbon fiber-reinforced polymer and glass fiber-reinforced polymer. So steel is in red. You see that, as I mentioned on the left-hand side, it goes linear elastic. I don't know if you see my mouse or not, but it goes linear elastic, and then you have a lot of deformation on a plastic range. With FRPs, with composites, um, this is the laser. Okay, thank you. So with with composites, uh, both for carbon and, and glass, you see that this curve, it's straight. So it's linear elastic until failure in both cases. Um, in both cases, the tensile strength it's higher than that of steel, as I mentioned. As you see, it depends on the type of fiber, also the behavior. So you have a, a higher tensile strength for carbon than FRP, and you have a higher modulus. The modulus would be the slope of this stress strain curve. So you have a higher uh, modulus for carbon FRP, very similar to steel and a lower modulus for glass FRP, as I mentioned before. But in both cases, and that happens for all the composites, they are linear elastic until failure. So again, this is a property which we 
we need to understand it so that we can design it safely and efficiently. Let's go back to these graphs again. On, on these two graphs, I'll show the density and the price. Um, afterwards, in the next couple of slides, what I will use is I will use these two uh, properties, uh, the, the weight and the, and the price, to normalize and normalize the tensile and modulus that I presented before. So if we jump into the weight, as I said, uh, pull through the materials are lightweight. So it's you can see here it's about one fourth of that of mild steel. While uh, the price, even though here in this slide it says that the pultruid materials are a little bit cheaper than mild steel, there is a big range here because it depends on the type of fiber, the type, it depends on the type of resin. So most of the cases I would say uh, it might be a little more expensive, even though there are some cases that it's cheaper as shown in this graph. So um, as I said, lightweight and similar price. If we jump on the next one and now we check how would that tensile strength per weight be or how would the specific modulus per weight of material be, then we, we will see that for pultruded materials, now the difference is not three times, but almost 12 times, because we have the three times more strength plus one fourth of the, of the weight. So now we have per kilo or per pound of material, we have 12 times more uh, strength capacity. With the modulus, even though the bare modulus, uh, as I said, it's one fourth of that of steel, we see that if we put it per kilo of material, now we have a very similar modulus or uh, slightly higher. And if we do the same thing, but for the price, we can see that um, the tensile strength, it's um, about one fifth in price one fifth of that of steel so i so for for four pound for four dollars you get one megapascal uh, with um, frp while you need 20 bucks to get that same strength with uh with steel so then you get a little bit of, of that comparison and with the models of elasticity now the difference is not four times so we have a three third like a three times different between steel and and pull through it elements. Okay, so my final slide would be about two other very important uh, properties. Uh, the thermal conductivity, as I mentioned, it's critical in buildings uh, and other applications where heat uh, needs needs to be maintained. So we see that here the difference between the protrusion and the mild steel. Uh, it's 1,300 times. Um, so basically, pull through the elements, uh, composite elements are non-conductive, while we know steel is conductive. And, and this slide, it's to put you a little bit in context on the shear properties that afterwards, uh, my colleague Ethan will talk, will talk about it, that it's, since we have the pull through the elements, that all the fibers are aligned unidirectionally, as mentioned here, through the protrusion process, they are very strong on that direction, but on the shear, um, the capacity is lower. So we see here that it's one fifth of that of steel, which again, this is a property and we'll take into account in design, but it, this is a critical property specifically for connections where the shear uh, plays a critical role. Okay, so with that, I'll introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. De Caso, which who will talk about what are non protruded um, materials. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz, and um, thank you everybody again. Uh, and we've been talking about protruded, but what are they and, and how are they manufactured? I think uh, understanding how protruded elements are made helps understand uh, in many ways how to use this material. So protrusion is a manufacturing process uh, used uh, uh, to make FRP that have a constant cross-section. The protrusion process involves essentially pulling 
our continuous fibers through a resin bath to impregnate them, typically with a liquid unreacted resin. The impregnated fibers are then pulled through a heated steel dye or mold, as you can see on the slide, where the resin undergoes curing or polymerization, resulting in a rigid composite profile with a constant cross-sectional shape. To date, the pultrusion process is primarily a continuous and automatic process. It requires the pulling mechanism, which in this slide is uh, represented as a caterpillar-like device, or sometimes it uses a series of grippers uh, that continuously pull the impregnated fibers through the dye. Uh, essentially, the dye will determine the shape and the dimensions of the final product, and some pultrusion processes will contain various features that may include uh, reinforcement inserts or surface textures. Ultimately, the pultrusion process offers several advantages as it allows the production of a high strength, lightweight, and corrosion resistant composite profiles with excellent mechanical properties as we've just seen. The continuous nature of the process also enables the very production of long linear profiles with consistent quality and minimal waste. Ultimately, pultruded composites are widely used in various industries, as we will see in the next slide. But pultruded elements, what are they? They primarily have two constituents. They have the resin and they have the fibers. You can see in the slide the different types of resins and fibers that are typically used in pultrusion processes today. The important aspect to understand in this slide is that the fibers are the load carrying component of the elements. They carry the load, the stresses, while the resin has two main roles. It protects the fibers from harsh environments and durability, and also enables load redistribution to the fibers across the entire cross section. It is well established that many examples of protruded composite products have been made and are used today. These include structural profiles, such as beam, tubes, rods, and FRP bars, typically used for concrete reinforcement, as well as grating, ladder rails, utility poles, wind turbine blades, spars, window profiles, cable stays, the list goes on. The versatility of the pultrusion process allows for this customization of the reinforcement material and also the resin system. Therefore, the profile can be designed, making it suitable for a wide range of applications. And what applications and in what industries? Well, as you can see on the slide, various industries benefit from FRP protruded elements, such as the construction, infrastructure, aerospace, the automotive, marine, and electrical applications. This slide shows a comparison of the major applications that are used protruded composites today and the competing materials for the same application. It is clear from the slide that metallic materials such as steel and aluminum and non-metallic materials such as lumber or wood are the to-go tradition materials that have been used in these applications where FRP is considered now to be a reliable alternative in all these different applications. So now that we know what non-metallic protruded elements are, how are they used? And hopefully by now with the examples and understanding materials and the key attributes that it has, you can imagine how they're being used. The best way to do this is through a series of examples. I want to highlight six different areas, starting with pedestrian bridges. I have two bridges to show you. This pedestrian and bicycle bridge, which is located in Walker Ranch Park in San Antonio, Texas, consists of six equal spans of 70 feet long by six inch wide. And it was designed for a live load of 85 pounds per square foot. The support truss and decking and handrails were all made from different FRP profiles, which were shipped unassembled and then reassembled on site. Uh, this bridge has a design service life for 75 years. This second bridge is a unique project that faced several design problems, ranging from environmental constraints, design criteria, necessary required bridge testing, assembly constraints, as well as shipping. The bridge was completed in 2021, and it is composed of 152 feet 
by eight foot wide single span. This is the world longest protruded pedestrian bridge. And it utilized the existing Bermuda Railway, as you can see, where the FRP was selected for its corrosion resistance to withstand hurricane wind forces, as well as meeting local safety and performance codes. For example, the Bermuda Building Code, which is based on the 2015 IBC, uh, referenced ASC 7 for the uh, loads. And these were primarily based on allowable stress design. Uh, the wind load uh, was based on 158 miles an hour uh, winds with three second gusts. This resulted in a 67 pounds per square foot net design pressure as it was a, an enclosed structure. If we compare it, for instance, with the first version of the Ashto guide, uh, the 2008 Ashto guide, the service load design at the same wind speed of 158 miles an hour would have resulted in a net pressure of 87 pounds per square foot. Uh, the life load in this project was reduced to 65 pounds per square foot as permitted by the um, IBC. Again, if we look at Ashto, the pedestrian uh, load would have been 90 pounds uh, per square foot. So I think it's always important to understand that FRPs can be used with different codes for the same application um, to really yeah. leverage their benefits. On the same project, validation testing of the member capacity that included the truss tension, compression, Euler buckling of compression members verification, as well as connection bearings uh, were conducted here at the University of Miami in our structures and materials lab, uh, as well as crane lift for installation of the bridge, which was a critical logistical uh, issue due to the limited cranes available in Bermuda. Um, and as part of this test program, the lift was simulated um, of the Bermuda pig at the manufacturer's yard, as you can see on the bottom right uh, image. Each uh, lift utilized eight pig points, and, and this is a critical construction aspect. You might have to lift at different points compared to traditional materials, and the lift required was uh, 20 foot in the air. Sh uh, shifting gears to vehicular bridge decks. Uh, this is a very interesting project uh, as it uh, dates an 143-year-old uh, Blackfriars Bridge in London, Ontario, which is really a rare example of raw iron uh, bowstring uh, arch truss architecture. It's really Ontario's oldest working uh, crossing at, at 221 foot in North America is the longest working span of its kind. The issue is that after being four years close, extensive restoration work begun in 2017 in order to rehabilitate the bridge. The bridge, in essence, was lifted from its uh, uh, granite abutments, cut at mid-span, and transported for full rehabilitation. The FRP deck was installed. Why? Because it was only 24 pounds per square foot. It did include stainless steel armor on the curbs for snow plowing, but today the bridge carries vehicles, cyclists, and pedestrians across the Thames River. It was the lightweightness of the FRP deck that made it key to regaining the structural capacity uh, while retaining uh, the beauty and uh, giving the long lasting performance of this bridge. When we look at the marine environment and marine construction, there are many applications. This 2015 Dominium Energy upgrade of the electrical towers allowed that at the same time, uh, the high capacity fender system was installed to protect the electrical towers, um, which is one of the busiest shipping channels in Virginia. And why was FRP chose? Well, the selection of, was because of its superior energy absorption, in addition to its corrosion resistance, which in essence translates to long service life. When we look at uh, sheet pile walls, uh, approximately this 1,200 linear feet of seawall using FRP sheet piles whaler tie rods and nuts were installed with water jet and vibratory equipment. The fiberglass shape piles and whalers, as well as the injection ports and plastic lumber spaces were pre-assembled in a panel sections on land and then transported and lifted by aerial crane for assembly. They were placed in front of the existing deteriorated concrete seawall with interlocking panels in order to ease the assembly they were attached, a fiberglass threaded rod nut into the concrete wall, 
and then grout was injected into the portholes from bottom upwards in its lifts. It is important to understand that soil conditions were medium dense sand and that the exposure of the wall really varied along its length. Uh, to that end, uh, length uh, of the uh, pile sheets varied between 5 and, 20, and 22 feet, and a complete uh, fiberglass composite sheet pile, whaler, and tie rod structure were used because of the long-term uh, performance and the long service life. Other seawall products were simply rejected due to the poor long-term performance and durability. Keeping with the marine construction, when we talk about docks and marinas, different FRP components, shapes, are used to build fully non-corrosive docks, marinas, and harbors around the world. Compared to traditional materials, non-metallic profiles offer fast construction methods, very key in many of these applications, as well as long-lasting solutions. Uh, in this case, uh, a pier which uh, will require concrete fill uh, well, there's no need for foam work as the piles and the caps and the beams can all act as stay in place foam work. Um, another marine uh, construction are sheep separators and camels. Uh, while these are a niche application, um, again, if you were to consider alternative uh, or traditional materials, these would become very expensive. So, cost really matters in this. Composite ship separators, in this case, are designed to handle the birthing energy of cruiser and destroyer type vessels. Fiberglass separators are resistant to corrosion, but in this case, the surface of these structures can be coated with an epoxy non-slip coating that greatly increases safety and operations. Separators can really be built up to any size. In this case, these were installed at Pearl Harbor Naval Station and they composed of um, three 40 by six, 40 foot by six foot uh, camels. And then the other one that you can see on the right hand side was 80 foot by 10 foot to protect the vessels and handle again, the birthing energy of these vessels as they duck. Wicked gates are essentially another example of movable dams used to help maintain a navigation pool in a river. Um, this is yet another, uh, a you know, great example on how FRP can replace traditional materials. Uh, in this case, 95% of the dams managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are more than 30 years old. And by the way, more than half of these have already exceeded their 50-year service life. So in this case, the Army Corps of Engineers, which had high maintenance of these traditional gates because of they're made of wood and steel, they wanted to look at FRP gates as an alternative. The um, uh, wicked gates that you see are award-winning FRP gates. Uh, they won the 2017 CAMEX Combined Strength Award, and they were installed in 2015 at the Paroya Lock and Dam in the Illinois River. The gates are 16 feet long, 4 foot wide, and 8 inch thick. And uh, they basically uh, fit within the existing hardware and structure of the dam. So easy replacement. And as a point of reference, you know, today's timber or wood gates last about 15 years. Uh, the predicted service life of these FRP uh, wicked gates are over 50 years. Now we're switching gears onto industrial tanks and processing equipment. Uh, we saw that in the early stages, FRP was explicitly applied to this industry, where corrosion is a serious challenge for many of these industries that use water and chemicals. And uh, FRPs have durability and abrasion resistance that outperform conventional materials. So FRPs often used for piping, tanks, scrubbers, custom equipment, and many other of this type of applications. In the figure, we can see this 36 foot by 36 foot four cell cooling tower, which combines uh, custom fiberglass components and structural shapes. Uh, the protruded pieces uh, meant less time and money for construction, which typically, as we will see also on the next slide, is critical. Pieces are chemically resistant, they're low maintenance, and were manufactured in a custom color, as you can see in this case, to complement the architecture of the campus. Uh, industrial plants, data centers, and many more applications were custom FRP 
truss type or moment carrying frame structures are an increasingly growing adaptation. For this, uh, an array of situations ranging from catwalks, access to industrial plants, installation around existing ductwork or piping, um, as well as data centers, where the critical path of construction is driven by other needs such as mechanical, environmental, plumbing, energy. Hence, FRP is really selected due to the quick construction. So systems can be up and running immediately. Additionally, sound walls and screen walls with acoustically insulated FRP panels are on the rise. And uh, finishing with, uh, pardon me, platforms and transportation uh, before last example over here. Um, in this case, FRP platform structures for transportation applications have also been in the increase. Uh, FRP platforms use, uh, are used in bus stations, train, metro, carpooling, um, because in addition, as we've already seen from the durability and ease of installation, FRP, as we learned before, offers non-conductivity. This is a great security benefit in modes of transportation that work with electricity. In this project, the deteriorated concrete sections of the platform deck were replaced with corrosion-resistant FRP deck panels. The entire platform was 220 foot long and eight foot wide, and panels were replaced in 32 feet sections for fast installation. In fact, each side of the platform was installed during one night period without any impact on the train schedule or the riders. And uh, last but not least, utility infrastructure. This is certainly a growing uh, area uh, with many opportunities. Uh, and again, if we look at California and the wild, fi uh, wild uh, fires that have existed um, in the last uh, years, it is considered the basically epicenter for fires. Uh, when a standard wood utility pole is exposed to fire, it loses its strength and has to be replaced. FRP poles, uh, in this case, uh, in, in some applications, if the fire uh, temperature does not exceed 400 Fahrenheit, it can be maintained in place. And you can see on the lower left image, um, uh, sensors that are uh, built into the poles that measure the temperature of the fire, typically placed about two feet from, from the ground where you see the highest temperature of a fire. Um, in this case, multiple utilities in California are switching from the wood poles to FRP um, in order to maintain grid reliability and uptime, very critical. I should say that also FRP utility poles and cross arms are rod proof, termite proof, and woodpecker proof, as we can see on the upper right uh, figure. With this being said, and before I uh, switch it over to my colleague Exxon, um, I wanted to uh, give uh, an understanding on the key engineering references that will help support the implementation of non-metallic FRP protruded elements. And I want to start with two things, uh, and maybe the obvious. The International Building Code recognizes the use of plastics in Section Chapter 26. And in fact, in Section 2613, it explicitly references, uh, references FRP materials. However, it is true that most references in the IBC are relevant to the uh, national uh, fire code uh, to ASTM standards for flame spread, smoke, and other types uh, of uh, issues, where the application has primarily been uh, used for cladding. But the point I'm trying to make here is that FRP is not a novel in the building code. It's not new. It, it is something that has existed for a while. And with this being said, I pass it on to my colleague Exxon that will continue on this subject. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Picasso. Hello, everyone. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to little talk about the code uh, references uh, and guide that are available for the engineer to design the FRP structures. We have a code and a standard which are already established in the US and Europe for the use of cultural FRP elements. Uh, first one, ASC 2010 uh, is the previous standard, and the second one, ASC 74, uh, which is recently published, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this in the next slide. And in Europe, we have a Eurocode, 
which is under development and uh, not published yet. Uh, beyond that, each manufacturer uh, generally has their own design guide. Uh, in, in that has a you know basic column strength, stiffness, and beam, and uh, recommended uh, connection geometry. But they don't necessarily give enough information to design a full structure. For instance, if you want to design a structure in the seismic region, uh, the only place you can find the seismic provision in, in ASC 74. And uh, going deeper into the established uh, guide, recently ASC conjunction with ACMA, the American Composite Manufacturer Association, published a new standard, which is uh, ASC 74, uh, low down resistant uh, factor design for protruded FRP structures. Uh, um, the new standard is based on the previous standard 2010. I'm trying to say that for the 13 years, uh, the knowledge already exists, but uh, engineers do not use the previous standard. This is standard after numerous ballots, hundreds of comments, and resolution of this comment last week was announced at the ACMA conference in the Chicago by John, John Busa, uh, the, uh, the vice president of ACMA, and uh, hopefully by the end of the, this year, it would be available. On the other hand, uh, our counterpart in the Europe also uh, has a uh, Eurocode, and it is under development, uh, CN, um, CN 19109, the uh, one technical specification, design of fiber polymer uh, composite structures. The, kind of, the content of the Eurocode is very similar and has the quite same arrangement as the ASC 74. As you can see on the slide, uh, we, can, we have a basic design, material, durability, structural analysis, and the uh, connection and joints. In this slide, I'm going to compare ASC 74 and AISC 360 for uh, steel structures. I hope you realize that the similarity between the FRP and steel structures. Anybody who has a steel background should not be afraid to implement FRP in his design. And we can use a protruded FRP as a steel alternative. As you can see, we have a quite safe standard section, such as a uh, you know, first one, a general provision, design requirement, design of tension member, conversion, lecture and shear, combined force, and the most important design of both connection. Uh, you know, connection in the FRP structures is a critical. So in the ne next slide, I will talk about the failure modes in the both connection. Okay, now look further into the uh, connection detail. For those familiar with the steel design, you may be familiar with the various potential failure modes in the steel connection. Such failure modes are presented in the FRP connection, but limited. For example, uh, we don't have a steel rupture in the FRP structure. Why? Because steel, board, uh, steel bolts are primarily used in FRP connections, so failure typically happens in the FRP species rather than the bolts. As you can see in the, in, uh, in the slide, we have a bearing, uh, bearing uh, failure. We prefer this failure happen on the protruded FRP members because it gives us a warning before failure, and it's a quite ductile failure. For net tension or a tension uh, failure, when a specimen is narrow compared to the bolt diameter, the failure might happen uh, this way. And the cleavage and shear out is almost the same. And uh, it's, uh, when happen, the fiber direction is uh, parallel to the load, uh, load direction. The last one, com combined direction, combines two different failure modes, net tension and uh, uh, shear out failure. Uh, I want to show you in this slide how similar the steel design and FRP design. You can see we have a three standard AISC 360, ASC 74, and Eurocode. You can see, uh, for, for example, for block shear failure, they all have initial factors uh, 106 for AISC 360, 1.5, and 1.4 for Eurocode. And, uh, and uh, we have a, another uh, factor for uh, functional for between the area and the forces. And for shear out failure is not observed in the steel connection. But even then, between the European uh, base guide and ASC, 
they are uh, very similar. So my main message to the engineer is not afraid to design, uh, you know, polluted structures. The fundamentals are the same, and the design approach is the equivalent. Okay, uh, I'm going to show you uh, to work uh, that has been done in the euro. We have a euro code and three design aids to support that. Uh, the second one, comment, uh, commentary document, contains nearly 400 individual background reports. The third one, uh, a collection of work examples. Uh, you know, uh, this textbook will help engineer and designer uh, to apply Eurocode. It was over a thousand pages, but unfortunately has not been published yet. And the last one, prospect uh, for new guidance in design of appropriate structures, is really good. And in this slide, we see a bunch of references, such as the, you know, the first two is a, you know, standard, and the third one, design guide for FRP uh, composite connection. Uh, it was uh, published by uh, in 2011 uh, by Dr. Mazlev, and uh, another great book, FRP Compos composite structures, uh, which uh, published in 2022 by the Garo in the University of Virginia, and uh, he used, you know, uh, the LRF LRFD approach in his design and the example, uh, uh, and use ASC 74 in the example. And another one, uh, Dr. Bank in 2006, uh, you know, published a composite for constructors. It was a great book, and he used uh, uh, ASC for uh, his uh, design. And uh, the last one, Antonio Nani, uh, he published in 2014, Reinforces Concrete with the FRP box. You know, but unfortunately, in the US, we don't have a design aids. You know, all these primary textbooks, which might not help as much as, you know, the design work example and design guard for the implement, uh, implementation by the engineer. But, uh, you know, here is a good realm of, uh, for future work. Uh, and I'm going to give it back to uh, my colleague, Dr. Picasso, to wrap up the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, that being said, I think when we start to think about what is the future of filtration technology in our construction and our built environment industry, I think if we focus on the three main key drivers uh, that are enabling the growth of these technologies, uh, that it gives us a, a side into that. And primarily is the growth of the construction industry market, uh, primarily for two reasons, right? It uh, increases productivity and it reduces time of construction. Uh, and that's why the construction market is adopting these technologies faster than in previous years. Uh, the increase in pollution is also um, being provided in the wind energy market. In a sense, that's dragging also and, and helping the construction market. But again, many of the key drivers uh, are to do with the ease of installation that uh, these uh, materials offer. But on the other hand, we have two key challenges that need to be addressed. And one is that typically the higher cost of FRP versus competing wood and steel or aluminum parts, uh, if we're only thinking at the project uh, deliverable. Uh, when we start to think long-term effects, maintenance, and other things, obviously this is no no-brainer. So if you are the owner, typically you will specify uh, non-metallic solutions. Um, but if you're not the owner, then other drivers affect the bidding process. Uh, and then yet the other uh, key challenge that we have is the lack of education. In, in essence, the lack of awareness. So what does that mean? Um, I think it means three items, similar to what we've seen, what is happening in Europe. Uh, we in the U.S. need to ensure that we, now with the published uh, ASC 74 LRFD design guide, for 13 years with a pre-standard, it is important that we generate the design guides, the design aids, and the design work examples to support uh, engineers in implementing very, in, in very similar fashion as um, designing with steel. And that being said, I just wanted to thank everybody, and I'm going to join ask uh, my colleagues to join over here. Uh, to move over, and uh, if there's any questions, we'll be glad to uh, ask uh, to answer them. Thank you, Francisco, Esan, and Alvaro for this outstanding presentation and sharing your insights with us today. Uh, yeah, do we we have some questions. Um, we'll go with our first one. Um, so, the our first question is that FRP composite gratings. Uh, experiences severe UV degradation. So, is there any developments to make pultruded elements more UV stable? 
That's a great question, and uh, I'll go ahead and take that one. And there are already many, um, many elements, many fillers that can be added to the resin during the pultrusion process in order to provide UV uh, protection. So if UV is a key criteria of the design, that is already taken care of. If we're thinking about temporary UV, that a material might be exposed temporarily during UV, and I think I get this many times with the FRP bars, right? Many uh, studies have shown that even if you have a bar exposed for six months, uh, you know, a regular sun, the properties don't get significantly affected. Uh, but today UV has been addressed, and again, this is something that if, if you are a specifier and this becomes a critical design criteria, that can be addressed uh, by making sure that you specify the, uh, the appropriate resin fillers and admixtures. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our second question is, can FRP be pultruded with transverse strand in a gross mass density comparable to that of the primary linear fiber set? Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So, I mean, whenever you are using the pultrusion process, um, you are mainly using unidirectional uh, fibers. So you have the rovings that go, as Dr. Vegaso explained, that go into the pultrusion machine. So the core of, of the element, it's going to be unidirectional. It's true that afterwards, uh, what they do, uh, a lot of the manufacturers, is they tweak a little bit that pultrusion process so that at one of the stages, once you have the pultruding element, you can wrap it up or have some transverse uh, fibers to have some confinement and have some extra capacity on the shear on the transverse uh, direction. But the pultrusion process itself, it will bring you unidirectional. So you can combine it, but it's not, I mean, it would be like an addition to that pultruded uh, process. And if I'll add to that, that depending on the overall structure that you're trying to generate, let's think about uh, wind turbines. That it, it, many components come to make the entire wind turbine, and each of those components are individually protruded and then assembled. So even though you have uh, primarily unidirectional pieces, which can have cross-link fibers, uh, you can then assemble these different components in order to create a, an overall element that. Uh, that again is going to depend on the stress profile that you have and what loads you want to carry. So I think the problem is that you can do everything with FRP, right? It, the, the opportunity is so high, you can yeah. model them, you can do that. So it, sometimes it's important to dial, it's difficult to dial back, but in, in essence, you can do anything and you're just limited by, by working with the right manufacturer. Yeah. That's correct. Um, I think, yeah, we have another question. Uh, in the protrusion process, do all the fibers have to be continuous? If not, what is acceptable percentage of continuous fibers across the cross section and what is the lap length? Yeah, I mean, I can take it. I mean, normally, so I'm, the, the protrusion process is with continuous fibers. Uh, the way it works, you have the rovings that it's where the fiber comes and those rovings are, are placed on one side of the protrusion process so then what happens is that of course that rowing is limited so once that rowing is done you will splice another rowing to that one so here as dr de Castro put on the screen so you have the rowings there i mean once one of the rowings is finished you will splice the next rowing into that so that it keeps the continuity. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the question, but yes, I mean, the, the fibers are continuous. They have to, yes. And, and again, you're typically limited by transportation lengths. So the, mm -hmm. sometimes you want very long elements to reduce the amount of installation, labor cost, and whatnot, and whatever, you know, 40 foot is what you can transport. So maybe that is what limits many times uh, this type of installations. Yep. So our next uh, question is like um, on resins because we talk about fibers. So if the num uh, if numbers are numbers in testing, why is it why is it does matter if FRP uses a thermosat versus um, thermoplastic resin with regards to composite rebars? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take that one, and I think this comes into that this yeah. slide. So a lot of it is about application. Right, and your application, you might have a corrosive environment, you might have a chemical environment, you might have an 
alkaline environment, depending on what that environment and the service life of that uh, you know, structure, then you're going to formulate your resin. And I'm not a chemist, so I'll start with, with that. I'm a, I'm a material scientist and a, and a structural engineer. Um, and, and resins, you know, is a, is a whole world, right? It's like saying food. It could be anything, right? Uh, primarily, thermosets are a one-way chemical reaction, right? So we cannot reverse. This is chemistry 101. Whereas in thermoplastics, you can reverse the, the, the chemistry. So in thermoplastics, uh, the benefit of it is that you can mold them and you can, you know, sort of pre-cure them and then finally cure them. Uh, and in thermosets, and you, you, the question was about vinyl esters and polyesters, where all these type of different, uh, um, you know, chemistry is about the strength of the bonds that are uh, the crystalline structure of those resins when they're cured, right? There's going to be things like temperature of curing and what is the, what we call the glass transition temperature of that resin that might be higher or lower. It might be also the durability and the permeability uh, of the resin, the porosity of the resin. All these different secondary properties uh, will, in a sense, determine the type of resin that you are using for your application. That's one side, right? As an engineer, you're thinking of your application. But on the other side, you have the manufacturer. But the manufacturer might be worried about speed of production, a fast curing time, um, a thermal benefits. There might be other things that they want to have maybe an epoxy versus a polyester in order to make sure that they can uh, you know, have a fast uh, production rate. Uh, and typically polyesters uh, are, are tend to be uh, less durable, especially in alkaline environments. So there, there's a lot of science that already exists on, on why choose X resin for that application. But it is very important that you understand what your application is, who's making it, and then you have the triangle, right, that trinity in terms of uh, understanding the best components. And I'm going to add one more thing. We do have the fibers, as we see on the slide. Fiber sizing is probably the most critical aspect. What do I mean by this? And again, this is more on the material science side of things. The fiber, each individual hair of fiber, has in essence a skin. And that skin is specifically formulated by the fiber producer to marry a resin. So there's a compatibility issue. So it is important that you use the rice resin to marry the right fiber. So you have good bonding and good durability. So there's many aspects, right? This is, is it is sort of like a complex uh, part, but there are many reasons why you would choose one resin versus the other, which is dependent, as I mentioned, on the fiber, on the application, and also on the manufacturing procedure. So uh, you talked about uh, the compatibility. So we have a question about long-term fatigue. So how do pultruded non-metallic shapes perform in resisting long-term long fatigue? How do their fatigue characteristics compare with other materials? That, that is an excellent question. I'm going to take that. And as I mentioned in the in this slide during the presentation, right, the resin and the fiber, the resin sort of protects it and trans, transfers the load. And it's the fibers, right? So the properties of the fiber is primarily going to be the constituent product for how it performs on a fatigue point of level, right? And carbon versus glass, these are very different products, right? Different materials, different constituents. Um, and more than fatigue, you also have creep. So back to fatigue 101, right? Fatigue is multiple cycles on, 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 on and off, right? Um, so similar to, uh, uh, to steel, carbon and steel uh, perform in a similar fatigue level. Glass does suffer also from a lot of fatigue uh, slash creep rupture, which is sustained load during a prolonged period of times. So how do we take care of that? Through the design, right? We uh, have a fatigue and uh, creep rupture factors that we factor in the material properties and the design process in order to factor serviceability uh, related uh, criteria. So the design captures that. And in fact, the reality is that we're using uh, today and, and this is also true for ASC 74, we're using sort of research that is from technologies that were done 10 years ago. Uh, we know that today uh, fiberglass products, basalt products, and carbon products have better fatigue as well as creep uh, rupture performance than they did 10 or 20 years ago. Um, but we understand that, you know, I always say, um, I'm going to do my analogy of cooking, right? Uh, I don't know if you like steak or fish, whatever it might be, but you don't get a steak, you don't cook it in the same way you do fish, right? It's different recipes, different materials, different produce, different ways of doing it. 
This is the same when we compare steel and FRP protruded elements. But we're going to design differently because each material wants different things. So I think if you can capture that essence, uh, you should feel very comfortable if we're using uh, protruded elements. Yeah, I think this was an excellent explanation. Um, so I'll go with our last question, and it is about the code. So um, the audience wants to know when ASC 74 will be published. So, so uh, I know that my colleague Exan mentioned it, but uh, so this was last week at the North America Protrusion uh, Conference that took place in Chicago. Um, as uh, Exxon mentioned, John Bucell, who's vice president for the ACMA, did announce that the, that same morning, ASC has approved the standard. So um, obviously, it now needs to be editorially reviewed before publication. After all, the comments need to be integrated into the final document. And that might take as little as four to maybe six or seven months. So I would assume that that document will be published by ASC and available either by the end of the year or early next year. But this is a really a milestone for something that has existed for 13 years. But I think engineers will feel much more comfortable. Um, but again, look at the pre-standard. It hasn't, well, there's been significant changes, but a lot of the information is already there. But this is an exciting because this is going to really pivot engineers and really uh, accelerate the growth uh, since we have sort of a, a good foundation to stand on versus before it was a little, little doubtful. Yeah, definitely. It's a great news uh, and we are looking forward to the standards. Uh, so thank you, Francisco, Asan, and uh, Alvaro for your presentation. Uh, before we log off, we have a couple of slides or I have some, some announcements. So we uh, thank you uh, all, the participants. Uh, we appreciate your participation and engagement and we look forward to seeing you in our upcoming webinars. Please visit aciuniversity.com to see the topics for our upcoming live webinars. Uh, on the screen, there are a few upcoming. Uh, and also, next have uh, announced call for ideas, and many of you might be aware of that. Uh, these ideas can be problem statements or project idea or research needs that will help to advance the use of non-metallics in building and construction. The initial deadline was May 15th and it was extended to May 24th, which is today. So please submit your idea forms by today. You can find the idea submission form on our website at www.nonmetallic.org. Once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, please remember to fill out our brief feedback survey that you will see uh, as we exit the webinar. If you are looking for continuing education credit and uh, were unable to join us for the education of uh, duration of the live webinar, so be uh, sure to complete the online quiz at aciuniversity.com. Thank you.